Uh, first, uh, I would like to, uh, to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to be here and talking to you. So, uh, I'm from Los Alamos National Laboratory. I will describe something very uh, connected to the previous talk. But first, uh, I would like to organize my collaborators. So, Joe Carson working at Los Alamos. Michael Forbes and Alex Gazerlis that are postdocs at INT and Kevin Schmidt in Arizona State University. So yeah, this is very similar to the first previous slide the, the first previous slide. So I'm interested in the crossover from the BCS to the BC regime where we're tuning the scattering length of the two body problem. We, we go from a system where we have uh, where we have BCS coupling, so particles pair, moving to the unitary limit where we have pairs that are very strongly correlated and pair, uh, up to the BC regime where the pairing is so strong that the the, uh, the different particles interacting in S wave forms molecules that. Uh, is that eventually becomes uh, a, a gas of bosons. So uh, we are talking about a system in dilute regime. I will explain what I mean. And yes, uh, the interaction is mainly in S wave. So the model, our model, uh, describes a system where only particle up or down or heavy and light interact. The, the temperature, in, typically in the experiments, is smaller is a fraction of the Fermi temperature. So essentially, we are talking about systems very close to, uh, to zero temperature. And uh, essentially, this crossover can be, can be realized in experiments, because uh, you know that the interaction is tunable by, mean, by using the flashback resonances. And then we can span the crossover, going from weakly interacting fermions in the BCS to weakly repulsive bosons of molecules. Okay. So just to clarify, I'm interested in 3D, not in 2D. So this is maybe trivial, but there are several examples of fermionic superfluids in nature, going from superconductors to liquid helium-3 to high TC superconductors. The pairing gap is typically uh, very small, so few order of magnitudes less than the Fermi energy. But now in the last, uh, in the last years, people get excited with, by these cold Fermi gases that exhibit the pairing gap that is the largest known in nature. So it's of the order of the, of the Fermi energy. And also a very similar system that, get, that got a lot of attractions. And, mainly is the field where I started to be interested in these systems is in neutron matter. Because, the, because the, the dilute neutron matter exhibits very similar properties to Fermi gases. But, but uh, Fermi <coughs> gases are very interesting to study because, uh, as I say, the, the interaction is tunable also in the experiment. Theoretically, it's easy, but experimentally, it is a very <coughs> uh, important challenge. There is the, this universality connecting very two different, fa uh, very two different uh, kind of systems. There are experiments, so you know very well that uh, people can very accurately measure several properties of these systems. So just uh, just focusing on unbalanced systems where we have an equal population between up and down, the equation of state can be measured with high accuracy. And then a lot of interest got to the contact parameter and property rela properties related to this parameter. And then uh, very recently, various responses like uh, the dynamical density response or spin response. But, and and these systems are very similar to low density neutron matter that, however, is uh, achievable only in the crust of neutron stars. So this is not re reliable by terrestrial experiments. And then it's very interesting to look at properties of Fermi gases to address properties of neutron matter. 
But then a, que a natural question is what happens with mass imbalance? So we saw several talks in these days talking about Fermi mixtures, but rather than up and down, of heavy and light mixtures. <coughs> so that's the overview of my talk. I will focus to Fermi mixtures, both at equal masses, or focusing to this mass ratio of 6.5 that corresponds to the lithium-potassium mixture. So I'll try to very quickly describe the model and the quantum Monte Carlo methods. And then I'll present several results uh, about the BEC, B, uh, the BCS, BEC crossover, the contact parameter, <coughs> and other properties. So typically, how, <coughs> what is the unitary limit? Is the limit where the effective range of the, of the two body interaction is much smaller than the interparticle distance that is much smaller than the scattering length. And at the extreme, the effective range is exactly zero and the scattering length is infinite. So we are saturating essentially the, the, the scale associated to the, to, to the length. And then the energy is can be conveniently expressed as, a, as a, a, a factor times the Fermi gas energy. So the model, our microscopic, uh, microscopic model to do the calculation starts from this many-body Hamiltonian where uh, particles are point-like point -like particles. And we have a kinetic energy for the first component the uh, kinetic energy for the second species of our system, and then uh, a two-body interaction that uh, acts only in S, uh, in S wave. So ideally, this interaction should be a point like intera uh, a contact interaction, but in practice, we typically use a, a, an interaction with finite effective range. So the system, as you know, is very strongly, uh, is very strongly correlated. And then this requires a non-perturbative uh, treatment to, accu to produce accurate calculations. And then that's why we use quantum Monte Carlo methods. So just to give you an idea on how these methods work, we, write, uh, uh, we, we start from a trial wave function at, imaginary t at some imaginary time. And then by applying the, the evolution operator, we get a wave function at some imaginary time t that in the infinite limit uh, collapses to the ground state or better to the lowest uh, to the lowest energy state that is not orthogonal from the starting point in practice how we do this propagation we we need a many body greens function and then we uh, that is applied to this uh, to the trial wave function and this gives the way the a new wave function at a new imaginary time but uh, again, in practice, this many, pro many body propagator is unknown. But there are nice approximations so that permit to use nice form for this propagator. So for example, the previous Hamiltonian is split by, okay, by a term uh, related to the kinetic energy and a term uh, related to the potential. But this expansion works uh, if we take uh, the small limit for the time step. So, we need to iterate this integration many times to achieve the convergence. In practice, also, we do important sampling. So rather than using this uh, Green's function, we use the modified one where we want to, to guide our, our sampling of configurations to be more efficient. But and this unless this function is very bad, this, uh, the use of it only reduces the variance but doesn't change the average uh, in, any, uh, in our observables. And then there is a sign problem because of fermion sign problem. And then we use a fixed node approximation. As, and as Stefano said, this essentially means that we get upper bounds. So there is a theorem assuring that we are getting an upper bound. And the upper bound is uh, as much accurate as we optimize the nodal structure of psi t. So in our calculation, we perform first uh, 
a carefully optimization, a variational optimization of the trial wave function, and then we do the diffusion, the propagation in imaginary time. So the main, I mean, the, the, the general structure of the wave function contains a just row term that is symmetric, and then the anti-symmetric terms that has the nodal surface that is very important. So for paired systems, this wave function has a BCS structure that essentially is a, a Slater determinant built uh, we, uh, by specifying pairing orbitals. So in this case, the two particles are up and down or heavy in light. And then we uh, the way we write these pairing orbitals is by an expansion in plane waves with, some f with a certain number of coefficients in front plus a radial form. And this is essentially the BCS form projected by fixing the number of <coughs> particles. For the short range potential, we consider different forms. So originally, we considered a posh teller form that is uh, here plotted, uh, showed by the black line. But some people, uh, but there is a, a typically a complaint, because in the mean field level, if the number of particles is large enough and you use a purely attractive interaction, the system collapses because it's finite, because the effective range is finite. So we try to explore the use of other two-body forces with hard core, with a, with a repulsive core that should avoid this eventual collapse. So we are typically, we tried in some case to use these three forms also to address what happened when the, when the effective rate is finite. So this is the BCS, BC crossover that we got for, in this case, for uh, the lithium-potassium mixture. So here I'm plotting the energy as a function of the inverse of the scattering length. And the two colors are the results obtained at two different effective ranges. Anyway, only by looking this plot uh, qualitatively, we see that we recover the weakly attractive Fermi gas at, uh, in the, in the in the deep BCS region, and we recover the repulsive Bose gas in the strong coupling, and then there is the and then there is the crossover. So, for equal masses, the best fixed node results today says that uh, the energy is 0.387 at unitarity, and this num I'm comparing this number with this uh, 0.37, that is a. Uh, uh, Lattice uh, auxiliary field quantum Monte Carlo that for this problem is exact. So here gives us an idea about the approximation, I mean, about the approximation that we are doing by making the fixed node. And, and just a comparison, this is the last number that was uh, measured by the MIT group that is very in agreement with the with the exact results, and, uh, and gives us a uh, touch on, on how far we are from the results. Anyway, the XI at 6.5, at mass ratio 6.5, is 0 0.368. So it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a appreciably smaller than for equal masses within the fixed node approximation. We can say, oh, but the fixed node approximation, we don't know if the, if the systematic error here and here is the same. But it's important to know that this number is within error bars. Uh, I mean, actually, it could overlap, but it's smaller than the exact results. So this difference, so the message is that this difference is real and is, should not be due to systematic errors. And then we want to see the effect of the effective range extrapolation. So here I'm plotting the value of psi at unitarity uh, as a function of the effective range of the two-body interaction. So first, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, these upper lines refer to the equal mass, masses case obtained with the three different potentials that I showed. We see that at least uh, up to uh, a value of Kf uh, Re uh, at about this value, 
the slope is linear, and then it starts to deviate, as expected. For unequal masses, uh, uh, we have a point uh, at very small effective ranges, but again, the slope looks like to be, to be linear, at least in this region, of course. So if we expand the energy uh, xi with a, by a constant plus a linear term, we found that is very interesting that this slope first is looks like to be universal and not depending to the model of the Chubari force that we consider. And then it looks like to be independent within error bars to the mass ratio, at least for the mass ratio where that we consider. And note that uh, this slope, the, the value of the slope, is also consistent by the exact calculation that is, however, very different because it's a calculation made on lattice where the effects uh, and the interaction is, is very different. So it's pretty intriguing that the two numbers agree. And this for both the mass ratios. So here now, uh, I try to, this is the, the equation of state cl uh, very close to the <coughs> unitary limit. And again, something weird is happening because I try to fit, here there's a, the line is a fit of the equation of state with these two parameters, so with three parameters. So essentially it's an expansion in, in one over AKF around unitarity. And surprisingly, Psi changes as I already anticipated, but the other two coefficients are very similar within error bars that are anyway very tiny. So it's a little bit puzzling that the only quantity around unitarity that is changing in the equation of state is the value of Psi, but not the other two parameters. And then here is the deep BC limit. So so these are calculations done at different mass ratios. So the black is 1, and, and then 6.5 and 10. And uh, we wanted to, to see if our fit can produce a dimer-dimer scattering length in agreement with few body calculations, and this actually happened. So, we, so these are the dimer-dimer scattering length that we obtained from by fitting the last three points. Of course, at 1 over AKF equal 1, uh, the Bose expansion is not in agreement with the quantum Monte Carlo calculations. But anyway, the values of the Dimer-Dimer scattering line that we got are in a very good agreement by a few body, with a few body calculation performed by Petrov, Salomon, and Shlyapnikov uh, at the same mass ratios. So now, uh, let's talk about the contact parameter. So you know there are these very uh, wonderful uh, <coughs> relations uh, introduced by Shina Tang, and it showed that essentially several quantities are uh, related by this parameter uh, called contact parameter. So by expanding the equation of state, the first, uh, the derivative uh, with respect to the scattering length essentially uh, related the, the equation of state to the contact. So the contact is equal to this factor times z, that is this coefficient. And then the contact is related to the momentum distribution in the high momentum limit. And then the pair distribution function between different particles is also related to the contact. Uh, parameter at short distances. And then we have the static structure <coughs> function, again, between different particles that is related to, to the contact uh, at high momenta. So we have several, of course, we have these universalities, uh, I mean, these universal relations connecting the contact to different, uh, to different quantities. So uh, this is true, and um, this is true uh, by this is through intense papers, but we don't know in quantum Monte Carlo calculations because I didn't say that uh, any operator rather than the energy is dependent, is biased by the wave function. 
So when we compute the energy, the fixed node approximation is the limit to get the, the real answer. But when we compute any operator but the energy, we, ha we have an important bias given by the variational wave function. So something interesting is to try to, to calculate several operators with quantum Monte Carlo techniques to see, uh, to see if they agree. So here, we essentially, I already mentioned the equation of state, but we computed the momentum distribution. Uh, so in this case, I'm plotting the momentum distribution times k to the 4 to see the tail. And uh, here is what I meant. So typically, we, we, we calculate an operator using the variational wave function expectation value. And then we, do, we, can, we calculate the same operator using the diffusion Monte Carlo. And then there is some relation to mix the two results to get uh, what I call extrapolation. So that's why the variational wave function is a bias for any operator but the energy. So here, we computed the momentum distribution, the pair distribution function, and the one-body density matrix. <coughs> and uh, we wanted to, to, to see if uh, the, the different ways to calculate the contact agrees. And we found that uh, within uh, the error bars given by the different operators, we found a contact that is, uh, uh, that is accurate in, within our approach at the second digit. So essentially, the message here is that uh, the wave function is good enough to describe the, all the operators we like at the same order of accuracy. And then, he, and then we computed for equal masses the contact in the, in the BC, uh, BCS crossover. So, so the line is the contact obtained by, uh, by fitting the equation of state uh, using quantum Monte Carlo results. And we also check that for several points, other quantities are in, uh, in agreement with the equation of state at different coupling strength. And then here, I'm comparing the, con the contact that we got from quantum Monte Carlo with the experimental measurement by the, uh, by the Australian group in Melbourne. Uh, and the red points are the points published in, uh, in this reference. And the blue points are recent measurements that the same group uh, retried to do uh, by claiming to have a much better accuracy. So we see that at unitarity, the agreement is, is excellent. And actually, the experimental error bar is smaller than the point. But then in the BEC limit, there is some disagreement. So surprisingly, we agree with the old measurement and the new one is a little bit lower. But here, the, uh, this number, this measurement is very preliminary. And we are trying to understand if the, uh, what's the effect uh, of the temperature. Because in the experiment, the temperature in the BC is much less under control. And especially, what's the effect, what's the real density where they take the measurement? Because essentially, uh, they are obtaining a density that is integrated along one direction. And it's not clear if this can be, can be taken as the reference density. So something we are trying to do is a local density approximation with the parameters of the cloud to see if Kf that they are measuring is the same of the Kf that we have in the bulk in our simulation. But the agreement at unitarity is is very nice. So here again, for equal masses, I'm plotting the static structure function for different coupling strengths as a function of, of the momentum in units of Kf. So in, the same, in the, same, the same group can measure the static structure function uh, by focusing at large momentum. Here is the comparison between the quantum Monte Carlo calculations and the experimental values that has some large error bar, but, uh, but the agreement is very good. So, so just to focus at the large momentum, uh, momentum 
value of the static structure function at unitarity, you see that our number is in a very good agreement by the, uh, the paper that they recently put on archive where they measure the dynamic uh, uh, response functions and then by integrating in energy they can get the static structure function. The agreement is very good and recently Chris Vale uh, reported a, a, an even better measurement with an accuracy of an order of magnitude uh, improved and again the agreement uh, is very is probably very very good. So a good question for the future is if whether it is possible to take measurements in the low uh, momentum components of the static structure function where the where we cannot expect that the the, uni that the universal relations still work. And uh, again this is very preliminary but uh, we computed several properties for the lithium potassium mixture. So here is the pair distribution function between heavy lights as a function of KFR. And here I'm plotting the same quantity by multiplying by uh, uh, the distance squared. So again, this plot should provide uh, another, uh, <coughs> another evaluation of the contact parameter by extrapolating this curve at small distances. And this is work in progress. And here is the momentum distribution. And again, here I'm plotting the, in the inset the momentum distribution times k to the 4. So to see uh, that the tail is linear. So I'm not, uh, I, I, I'm not directly comparing this to the equal masses case, but, uh, but the results are very similar. But this is expected because, because these quantities are related to the contact. The contact is related to the equation of state, in particular to not to psi, but the other parameters. And as I show, the fit of the other parameters is uh, within error bars the same at the two mass ratios of 1 and 6.5. So it's not, expect, it's not uh, uh, surprising that these quantities are, di are very similar to the equal masses case. But now we, may, we computed the pair distribution function between lithium-lithium uh, and potassium-potassium. And there is some difference that we are trying to understand. So, uh, so essentially, this doesn't <coughs> happen in equal masses, and this doesn't happen in a variational calculation. So this is given by the projection in imaginary time. So, so uh, so this is probably due by different correlations between the center of masses of pair, because this correlation is not in the variational wave function. So that's why in the variational calculation, this difference doesn't happen, while it happens with the projection, because the, the missing correlations are automatically built up by the projection in imaginary time. And this could be potentially quite interesting, First, because it could be measured. For example, something that we are computing now is the static structure function between heavy, heavy, and light, light. And we expect that they should, they should be different. But then it could be measured, because by doing Bragg spectroscopy by the Australian group or some other group, they could potentially measure uh, these properties by tuning the laser to kick the heavy or to kick the light particle in, uh, and, then, and then see the difference. So we are trying to understand the origin of this difference. And as I say, this should be related to the different correlation between the center of mass of pairs. And then <coughs> let's move the last two slides to the uh, polarized case. So it's interesting to look at the quasi-particle spectrum for, again, the lithium-potassium uh, Fermi mixture. So we can, do, we can estimate the quasi-particle energy by adding to our system another particle with momentum K. And then in our case, the, the bulk is of 66 particles that should be large enough to describe the thermodynamic limit. 
and here is the quasi particle dispersions for the for the light particles and for the heavy particles a different coupling so in the light case uh, the minimum uh, in the strong coupling i mean str it's almost strong coupling let's say the minimum is at momentum zero uh, a zero momentum while in the other cases the minimum is at a different k so that's probably because the binding uh, the strong binding of the quasi particle with the bulk but it's interesting to see that uh, for the heavy for the heavy <coughs> branch the scenario is different apart moving the the minimum of k the minimum of the curve a different k but it's interesting to see that the, the more binding is in the, in the weak coupling. And this is not expected because, because, the, because, the, the, because the strong coupling should provide much, uh, much more binding. And then naively, uh, we were expecting to find the, uh, the minimum of uh, the minima of this curve corresponding to strong coupling to be lower than the others, but this is not happening here. So, so there is something to understand, and uh, but anyway, this means that uh, there is qualitatively a different, uh, potentially a different effective interaction between quasi light particles and quasi heavy particles. And that's, again, something different from the equal masses case, of course. And then, finally, here the, polar, the, the polarized uh, diagram. So for the majority, light, uh, majority heavy, uh, the blue points describe, uh, represent calculations performed using a wave function with uh, describing a normal phase, so without BCS correlations. And uh, this, uh, the red points are obtained by using a trial wave function with BCS correlations. Uh, so the, the idea is the same that Stefano described about the polar on a molecule. So the wave functions are different nodal structure, and then we are projecting the properties of a normal a system with a, in a normal phase or in a superfluid phase. So it is possible by, by making a Maxwell construction, so essentially by writing, by drawing the tangent between uh, the, super, uh, the lowest superfluid, uh, I mean a tangent between the two curves to understand where is the critical point where uh, mass separa uh, a phase separation starts to happen. And uh, it's, uh, it's interesting to note that for majority heavy particles, this, this critical concentration is very similar to the equal masses. So this is the value at equal masses, and this is the value in the majority for majority heavy. But according to our calculation, in the majority light case, the concentration is actually overlapping with zero. That, that means that, that uh, potentially it could not we couldn't have we we could have no phase separation in the assistance, but again we we need to reach some more accuracy in the calculation before claiming this. But again, potentially the physics of this system could be could be very different from equal masses case. So here are the conclusions. I show it that several static properties of equal masses mixtures are well in agreement with available experiments. So we potentially hope that the accuracy in an equal masses case is, is, uh, is well as in the other case. Most of the properties of the lithium potassium unbalanced system are very similar to equal masses case. But, uh, but nevertheless, the Xi is uh, uh, appreciably different. And then also the pair distribution functions between same heavy, heavy, and light, light particles are qualitatively different. And finally, I try to show and to describe the, uh, the phase diagram of unbalanced uh, systems. 
showing that it is qualitatively different than equal masses at unitarity. So it should be interesting to look at this phase diagram at different coupling strands that it was looked at in equal ma for equal masses and to try to see if there is some new physics. And thank you. So we open for questions. Uh, yeah, I have a question on uh, on the quasi-particle spectra that you showed. Uh, uh, so, uh, especially the one on the BCS side, yes. So it yeah. seems to almost touch zero around KF. Uh, so is this so the the yeah? It what, could be. What, what are the, <coughs> the implications of this? Uh, does it mean that you have an instability at yeah, some point? Yeah, that of course. If this would would be zero, this means that there is an instability. In this plot, it's not clear. I mean, actually, this is a little bit above zero. So it would be interesting to go to strong coupling, I mean, to weak coupling to see what happens there. Because this is, this is a, in the BCS limit. But yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting effect to see. In any event, is the indication that so something is getting soft, no, at that yes. wave vector. Uh, sorry, concerning the slide, uh, the uh, following slide, just one slide, yeah. Uh, concerning this, I don't know if it's uh, something uh, which is absolutely not related to what Pietro was uh, finding for this polar onto molecule uh -huh. uh, crossing. But uh, let's say regardless whether it's uh, op um, a broad resonance or a narrow resonance, mm -hmm. having, uh, let's say, a mass imbalance seems to move this polar onto molecule crossing from, uh, let's say, the BEC side towards the mm -hmm. BCS side, the heavier is the impurity. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, I think for uh, broad resonance, uh, uh, for uh, the, let's say, mass ratio of lithium and potassium, mm -hmm. if you have uh, a potassium impurity, I think the polar onto molecule crossing appears almost at resonance. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, I think that this might be related to yes. this effect. In fact, uh, uh, these lines actually show uh, <coughs> the expansion in quasi-particle, where the first term is just the Fermi pressure, the second term is the binding energy, oh, and the third term is the pressure. And uh, this is shown by these lines. So what we found, I mean, the, the, the first point here is, of course, the, the energy of the polaron. And it, at that time, we calculate the energy, uh, the energy and the effective mass of the polaron. And again, we found a good agreement with another calculation by, I think, Combesco and uh, uh, Riccati and <coughs> other guys. And we found good agreement. So uh, in fact, I was uh, very interested by, by your talks about the polaron energy and the fact, especially the effect of the effective range to to that transition. Yeah. So, can I have more questions? Okay, Dorothy. Just go around here. <coughs> so you you showed that you looked at the. Um, heavier mass ratios on the BEC side, in particular mass ratio of 10. Yes. Did you also um, consider sort of more normal um, wave function in that regime? To the, sorry, what? A normal wave function. So what you've, you've looked at is sort of a superfluid wave function, right? Yes. I um, always use the superfluid wave function. Uh, but would the normal wave function give you lower energy and then possibly indicate a collapse of the system? Not at this mass ratio. I mean, actually, if I increase, so this mass ratio of 10 is, uh, is artificial in the sense that I think there is no Fermi mixture combination experimentally reliable, but we wanted to stay away from this 13.6 value. That means eventually collapses. <coughs> so I tried some calculation, even at unitarity. 
at mass ratio around 15, and already there the collapse is, is happening, eventually happening. So in the simulation you see the, the local energy that is stable for a while and then it drops, indicating a collapse. This is B, deep BC, but I didn't try to use normal wave function here. But um, I think the collapse could be seen because uh, it happened at unitarity, and here the coupling is uh, much stronger, so here it should be even easier to see the collapse. So, any more questions? Okay, so, no? So one, two, three, there you go. <laughs> one more question. Uh, maybe, uh, could you go to the slide with the, um, where you calculated the phase separation for, so uh, X prime is the concentration of the, uh, X prime is the, yeah, it's the, just the, to, to identify the concentration of where we have majority light yeah. or majority yeah. heavy particles. Okay, yeah. so the fact that the uh, critical value of X prime is uh, almost zero, doesn't mean that you have always phase separation. Uh, I've not understood it. Uh, I think that... So it's not the other way around. So, so you, uh, you, you are, if I well understood, uh, you, you have said that uh, X prime, uh, the, such a small value of X prime means that uh, you may not have phase separation at all, right? Uh, yes. Yes. I mean, okay, it's not clear. But no, 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 okay, let's assume that this is zero. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, it would mean that... Uh, but, it wouldn't mean that you have immediate phase separation as soon as the, no, uh, uh, or maybe I'm interpreting, uh, oh, the, maybe I'm interpreting yeah, wrongly. No, 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 yeah, may, yeah, maybe it was not clear. Yeah, it would mean that immediately have phase separation. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, Sorry. okay. Okay, and so does this, uh, um, maybe this is a question, is a, is a question to Carlos, does these results uh, qualitatively agree with your results. The, 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 the majority, because you, you know? Majority light. Is it where, where are you located in the in the, in the, in the you fixing the, the scattering length, right? Yeah, this and is at unitarity, right. yeah. So I would say that uh, both of those guys are there. So I don't I don't cannot tell precisely what the, the, mm -hmm. the number would be. But then unitarity already for <coughs> the best case we have most phase separation or you know very, very, very small value. Mm -hmm. Okay, any more questions? No? Okay, so then let's thank uh, Stefano again and all the speakers in the session. <laughs> so we officially uh, then uh, be closing the, the meeting, but I, I want to mention one thing, I think, which is very important. I think probably Rudy and I would, uh, would mention that. I'll, I'll speak for him, even though we didn't talk about it. I mean, this, uh, it was really possible at the end of the day because there were a lot of people helping make it happen, right? And specifically, I mean, uh, we have one person here in the back that was really, at the end, re responsible somehow to keep everything going. And Jane, who 
who is not here, unfortunately. Huh? She's watching. She's watching. <laughs> okay. So Jane, thank you very much for helping. Also Lisa, <coughs> if they're filming, okay, <laughs> YouTube, I guess, right? Uh, uh, for for helping out. So Lisa was uh, taking uh, uh, at the beginning, and then Jane came in, and uh, you know, and Hossein, of course, was the guy that really held everything. So we don't know anything, but everything went smoothly, I hope. But there was a lot of work of background by, by these people, and I would like to thank them very much. So let's go. Thank you, Hussein. Would you like to say something else uh, before we go to the... Uh, no? Okay. So thank you, everyone, for coming. And then uh, the colloquium, I believe, it starts at uh, 4... thirty. Right. And then there is coffee and refreshment. So okay. say around quarter to four, we can start walking from here to make it to the right. this short talk and then and refreshments and then there. Right. So we, at three forty five, a few minutes we can walk up. Yeah. Okay, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you.